All right, it looks like everybody's here, bright and early. Let's go ahead and get started. Hi, everybody. My name is Darren Dunlap. I am a senior product manager with Cisco, working in the business unit, the t collaboration technology group. Um, and I'm excited to be back here it's at Cisco Live in Berlin. Last year was the first year here, obviously, but the first time, too, that we talked about Spark APIs anywhere, really, in terms of big events. So this was, uh, that's great. We have some great updates for you now this year as well. So um, hope you enjoy what we go through here. Certainly make it interactive. If you guys have questions, let's see, is there a mic for people to ask questions or should we just handle them independently? Looks like independently, okay. So first off, this is a you know, standard sort of disclaimer, safe harbor statement that everything I'm talking about here is pretty much public knowledge, but if there's anything we get into that's futures oriented, you know, that's all subject to change. So just keep that in mind as we go through. So quickly on the agenda, I'm just going to try to quickly go through. Actually, before I jump into the agenda, let me see how many folks are really familiar with Spark in general, just Spark as a solution. Just raise your hand if you know about Spark. OK, so most people, that's great. More, more than last year, which is awesome. What about Spark APIs? How many folks have actually investigated or worked with Spark's APIs? OK, so maybe a quarter. All right, so it's a good, I'll, I'll spend some time on the overview, making sure everybody else um, has a good sense of, of really um, what the larger picture is around Spark and our APIs. Then we'll get into what's new. Uh, for a lot of you, everything's going to be new, but we'll certainly get into the uh, what's new for those that are are familiar. And I really wanted to try to tie this back to a real world example. So I have a use case example I think has some real practical um, business value you'll find pretty interesting. And actually get into some demonstration of the APIs. So first of all, let's take a high look at uh, what we're doing with our cloud collaboration platforms. Because it's really a broad spectrum of use cases and scenarios that we're trying to address with Spark and its APIs and platforms. So at the top left is really the complete collaboration solution. So Spark is absolutely a set of applications. It's a set of endpoints. It's a cloud service um, that you can use just off the shelf. You don't have to do any sort of development. Uh, it's just basically a, a product and solution set that you can purchase and use. Um, so that's one end of the spectrum. The far other end of the spectrum is really about being able to take collaboration technology and integrate it into your own applications, right? So we have modular building blocks, just pieces of technology that you can integrate into your own apps to make them more collaboration enabled. And then there's a whole range of scenarios in between, right, that, that people can combine these things. So that's really kind of what we're looking to do. And, and a lot of it's just about focusing on business outcomes and improving business processes through custom things that any business might need. So the way that we've really built this is, first of all, a couple, it's almost a couple years ago, we acquired a company named Tropo. How many folks here are familiar with Tropo? OK, good, most people. Um, so Tropo, what they had was really not a product, but a set of develop, like collaboration uh, platform as a service, if you will, where you can actually just take your, um, their APIs, which are very simple to develop with. And that was a key thing of what they've done. They made it super simple to be able to integrate uh, PSTN telephony services and SMS tech services into applications. So it could be a collabor collaborative application or it could be a non-collaborative application. But um, an example of like a non-collaborative application would be if you want to just make like a multi-factor authentication through SMS integration, Tropo can enable you to do that. But you can also very easily, just as a web developer, not any special SIP or CTI or other sort of skills, um, even even develop IVRs and that sort of thing with Tropo. So so that was a great move that we did as Cisco, I think, and we pulled them, and, and through that acquisition, we got a lot of really awesome talent that has helped us build out the Spark for Developers platform, which is the, the green box there on the left. So that, that expertise in terms of making it super easy to develop has been applied to Spark and our APIs. And what we're doing there is really not just targeting the ability to you know, integrate Spark capabilities into other applications, but also enable um, our partners uh, to be able to expand on the, the ecosystem and solution set that people can 
uh, consume around Spark and, and address more vertical and uh, similar sort of use cases. Uh, and then we also, also have a, a vision of making it possible for people to even customize the Spark experiences. So that's, that's a little farther looking out, but um, certainly a direction we're headed towards. So I only have 45 minutes total for this talk, so I have to focus, and I'm not going to be able to cover Tropo in any detail here, but uh, certainly if you're interested in learning more, we have experts here. We have a, a stand or a, a pod here in the DevNet zone. Uh, there are workshops and so forth, so f uh, feel free to check that out if you're interested. But the Spark platform is going to be the focus of the rest of this um, presentation. So just a level set also on what Cisco Spark is. Cisco Spark is a cloud collaboration platform and solution built really from the ground up to tightly integrate these key workloads that are listed here around messaging, meeting, and calling. And this is business messaging, not the traditional IMM presence. This is persistent across any device, get to your content in the, in the exact same state anywhere um, you may be and make that really a seamless part of your collaboration experience um, from asynchronous work to synchronous work with meetings and calling. So we've very tightly woven these services together, um, which really makes it unique, especially when you consider the room-based aspects of this in terms of our physical video endpoints that connect into Spark, our Spark board. How many folks are aware of Spark board? OK, maybe half the room. So. Um, we have the Spark board here. It's a new presentation and whiteboarding and virtual meeting solution that we have uh, just launched recently. Very exciting, and it really tr going to transform and tie together all of these technologies in terms of what you can do within physical spaces when you need to meet, as well um, virtually bringing people into those same meetings. The calling is really around our, our um, kind of our heritage around Unified Communication Manager and our uh, on-premise telephony, but doing that in a cloud model. So it's a cloud-based PBX and telephony service that also integrates through the partner services shown there in the bottom middle around PSTN services. And another very key part about Spark is our hybrid meetings, our hybrid services. So, so obviously, not everybody's going to jump to using the cloud immediately. A lot of folks want to stay on-prem and use some cloud services. Some people want to migrate from the on-premises uh, deployments of collaboration to cloud ultimately. And our hybrid services really allow you to tie together the premise and the cloud from a directory, calendar, even calling experiences. So there's some really cool and unique stuff that we're doing there. Uh, another very interesting thing that's maybe come out since last time we were here is our media node. So hybrid media services being able to actually put our media um, m engines essentially on your premises and have that work seamlessly with your, your Spark cloud services. So that's a quick overview of Spark. Um, and the APIs and integrations, the bottom left on this slide, is really the focus of this talk. So um, why should you care, right? I assume there's a lot of developers here in this audience or people that work with developers, and you want to know really what's the value proposition around Spark and its APIs. Well, it's really targeted at, at, at our customers, certainly, in terms of being able to tie Spark uh, in a custom ways into their own business processes and make it easy for them to develop and deploy these things. But also our you know, ISV partners, our service provider partners, our business, um, our channel partners that uh, want to differentiate and profit in their own unique way around collaboration with Spark and, and what Cisco has to offer. And a key point here, too, is this is not just your, um, you know, off-the-shelf sort of consumer technology. This is enterprise-grade collaboration, the best you can really get, we believe, in the marketplace. And being able to really tie that into the actual uh, business outcomes and, and work processes that you need to do for your businesses or the target markets you're going after, we think is a really important uh, thing we need to enable and want to partner with folks around. So that's from the developer perspective. For end users, uh, it's really about teamwork, right, and being able to very seamlessly whether you're in sales, support, engineering, marketing, um, what have you, IT, being able to take these collaboration tools and customize how they work for you in your, in your work process, your, your businesses, and what you need to do. So it's really about automating things where you need to in a very easy way, streamlining your workflows, um, and ultimately, too, 
one of the things I'll be talking about, even in this in this uh, presentation here, is how do we make it easy to put collaboration in the context of your own applications? So we'll get to that when we talk about some of our client SDKs um, later. Actually, before I jump into the depot, any questions so far? Does it make sense? Anybody have any comments or questions? OK. So the Cisco Spark depot is another key part of why you should care about um, Cisco and its API, uh, Cisco Spark and its APIs. Now the depot is a way if you're going to be developing integrations uh, or bots even with with Cisco Spark, and you want to make them easily discoverable and consumed by your you know it could be as a customer, your own set of users, or it could be as an ISV or uh, um, a partner that wants to develop something and sell it into the market. The depot allows you to really advertise and make that easily accessible uh, and discoverable by users of Cisco Spark. So basically, I think it was in the fall time frame, we, we launched this depot. It's depot.ciscospark.com. Let me just quickly jump over and show you what that looks like if you haven't seen it. How many folks have actually um, used the depot or, or poked around at the depot? OK, only a couple folks, so that's good. Um, in terms of just let's getting this information out to you. So this is the depot, depot.ciscospark.com. You can go to it. You don't have to log in or anything. I am actually logged in. But what it does is it has basically a catalog here of all the integrations and bots that people have developed. We're kind of featuring some key things here on the, on the home page. But as you want to get in and, and actually find specific integrations, maybe in a particular um, category. Sorry, the Wi-Fi here is, is a little slow this morning. Um, but it's going to give you the, the list of all your integrations and what's available by different categories. And as a user, you can very simply, like for example, if you want to enable Box um, integrated into Cisco Spark, you simply just go to the Box option that's there and connect. So you can click through and actually just authenticate into your Box account and, and Spark and connect that in. And actually, then you can get updates about what's happening with your Box files in the Spark application. So that's one example. Similarly, bots are available here, and you can do the same sort of um, uh, you know, discovery and use of them from here. Now, a key part of why this is interesting from a developer's perspective is that it's a fairly simple process when you have something developed to actually go and submit it to Cisco and get it shown there in the depot. And we're, we're also working on making that process even simpler. So uh, it'll be very, before long, it's going to be very self-service and happen uh, very quickly for you as you come out with new integrations or bots. This is just a high-level example. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but what you can do with the depot um, in terms of kind of from an end user perspective, why it would be helpful and have these integrations. So this is a HR example, some people working on some onboarding um, processes. And so, for example, let's say there's some task that needed to be accomplished separately for this onboarding process. Being able to hook into task management sort of applications in, in terms of like Red Booth is, thrown, is shown here, but actually when somebody's gone into Red Booth and shown or, or assigned a task to somebody, have that automatically show up with you know at mentions, um, links to useful information right there within Spark. And then it's very, it makes it very natural and easy for people to collaborate and following up on that task, which is shown here. Even jumping into a live meeting, um, following up with content developed to deliver on that task, for example, right? And then as somebody goes and implements through change management sort of systems, for example, a ServiceNow integration is shown here, being able to have the updates that happen there automatically show up so everybody's aware of it, be able to follow up as needed beyond that and so forth. So I think you get the sense that it's really about bringing the information and the activities that are happening and all the other tools people might use into a, a space here within Spark where it's very easy to collaborate with your team members and continue that conversation without missing pieces that might be happening separately outside of what you're doing. Um, so just to kind of summarize, too, there is a very good range of um, development sort of options that, that customers and users have. So obviously, the business users on the left, they're really the consumers of the Spark Depot, right? So they can just go in and easily configure those the use of those integrations and bots that are delivered through that. There are also you know, um, 
packages, so thir third party ISVs, and there's some examples shown here where they've actually gone and developed solutions on top of Spark, and they're e either marketing those through Depot or they can sell them direct them, you know, for themselves to their customers as their own packages. The, the other case, which I'm not going to spend any time in, in depth here, but there's also sort of a power user approach in terms of workflow connector tools. Um, for example, if this, then that. How many folks are familiar with if or if this, then that, or um, Zapier, Built.io? These are these are application or tools really where you can, as a power user, kind of go in and, and kind of create your own um, integrations by tying, say, one application into another. A lot of times, it's very simple in terms of a, a graphic user interface or wizard sort of steps that you go through to do that. Some require some light coding or allow you to do some light coding to get more sophisticated. Um, so think about that, that, uh, that capability with Spark as something more targeted at your power users, IT, uh, those sorts of folks that can really um, make, make the most use of it. And then on the far right, and that's where we're going to spend the most of the time here in this, this session, is around full development, really actually using the APIs to come up with integrations and bots and, and so forth and making those available for your users or for other companies to consume. All right, so now we're going to jump into the Cisco Spark for Developers um, actual experience. So the way this is fundamentally enabled for developers to discover what the APIs are, start using them, that sort of thing is, is Spark for Developers, we call it. And it's basically a portal. So, so developer.ciscospark.com um, you know, has your typical documentation, but some really interactive things with it, too. How many folks have been on developer.ciscospark.com? OK. A handful of folks. So I encourage you to check this out. It doesn't cost anything. You can start using this for free. You just sign up for a free Spark account. You can log in and start developing with the um, interactive capabilities there or experiencing those. But let me actually jump over and show that to you. Let's see. So here's Spark for developers. You know, and this is actually something that doesn't really look like Cisco, right? This is kind of playful, inviting, pulling people in to uh, kind of want to explore more. So. You know, it make it very easy to get started here. This is going to take you to a page where you can actually get some high-level information about Cisco Spark and the APIs. And actually, if you're logged in, immediately start running API calls right here. But let me show you a, a more um, concrete example of that. So, for example, people. What you can do is you can, you know, you can look up people. Um, you can get information about different people. I'll talk some more about that in detail, but one of the things you can do is, is even just get some information about yourself through the API, the people API. So that's a documentation around it. So if you log in here, actually let me show that first this way. You know, it's just going to show you, okay, this is the API call you would make. You know, it's a RESTful call just to get some information about yourself from Cisco, it, it, you know, your identity essentially in Cisco Spark. Now, the really cool thing is we've integrated this test mode. So you just turn on test mode here in the portal, and you can immediately start running and playing with these APIs. So like this one, I can just click and hit run. And it's going to actually make the call out to the cloud, and it comes back with a bunch of details about myself. But you know, if I wanted to go and do the same sort of thing um, in terms of a, you know, particular people in the company I want to look up, I could just go and put that information here right in the page and hit run. If I wanted to create a room and test how that might work, creating teams and so forth, you can do all of that right here in the portal. You don't even have to jump over to a separate development environment to start getting familiar with it and, and playing and see how these things work. So we think that's a really inviting and, and um, cool way to help people get started with the APIs. Of course, there's lots of other information in here about different aspects of the APIs. But um, we, one thing to point out, too, is we have SDKs that are available. These are basically wrappers of the API. So if you prefer to develop in Java or JavaScript like lots of people do, you can simply get these. Um, they're open source API or SDKs that you can download off of the web and start developing with our APIs in the language that's you know probably more natural for you. But basically any of the any of any program language that can make HTTP requests can use the, the the RESTful Spark APIs with our cloud. So that's a quick run through of the Spark for Developers portal. Now, another really important thing is support, right? So we've, I think, really made this super easy. But still, there's times when you have questions, you're going to run into issues, you're going to need some help. 
Um, and that's available 24-7. There's no cost for it. It's very responsive. So all you do is click through the support area of the, the portal, which I didn't show you, but you can go. And, that's, and we do a lot of the support through Spark itself. So it's really awesome. All right, now let's talk about the specific APIs themselves. So these are, again, RESTful APIs. Um, we're using the standard you know, HTTP verbs to, to work with these. So your gets, your puts, your um, posts, deletes. And these are the resources that we have available. So these were all, if you'd, if you'd noticed when I went through the portal, they were kind of listed down on the left. But uh, we talked about people. So not only can you look up information about people, so then you can do certain things with the APIs and uh, you know around those people, which we'll talk about here. But one of the new things, too, that since we were here last, because initially all you could do is look up folks in Spark, now you can actually use the APIs to manage people as well. So the, that sort of that second row there, organizations, licenses, roles, those are a RESTful APIs that you're going to use in conjunction with people to actually add people to your organization, assign you know, entitlements and privileges to them. Um, you can change their, their uh, settings as well. So um, that's what we're calling our admin APIs. So that's one of the very uh, cool new things available since uh, we were last here. And that's been, a, that's been available since, um, I think, the fall time frame. So Teams is another big important one. So initially when we, f we came out with Spark, it was really just rooms. And so people had sort of just a room for everything. We've kind of up-leveled that in terms of what you can do in terms of organizing rooms. Um, and those are called teams. So teams are really a container that you can put people in. You can associate rooms, or, or now we're calling them spaces. You can associate them with the teams. And you just basically then, it makes it much easier for users to organize you know, their work around a particular topic or project and sub sort of topics or, or um, work streams within their team. Uh, so, so there's a Teams API where you can create teams, you can update teams, you can delete teams, that sort of thing. The Rooms API is, is, has been around since the beginning, and that's basically the same idea. You can create rooms, you can modify, delete them, you can associate them with teams, and then you use memberships, and there's a couple types of memberships. There's a room membership, there's a team membership, but that's what you use to associate the actual people in your organization or others, it can be outside your organization too, with your teams or your rooms. And then probably the most important one is the, is the messages, right? So that's how you get content programmatically, whether it's text, um, we also support now Markdown, so you can do a lot of formatting around the text that shows up in your, in your rooms or your spaces. And uh, you can put files into rooms through this API. And then the last one shown here are webhooks. So how many folks know what webhooks are? Okay, a couple folks. So webhooks are really a way to get information as it happens in Spark out to you. So it's a kind of a, um, a notification mechanism or event mechanism that you use. So basically what you do, the way it works is um, when you create a webhook, you're basically telling Spark, okay, when a certain thing happens in Spark, like a message goes into a particular room, um, send me that information. Let me know about it and send me what the message is. And what you do is you provide essentially a URL that Spark will then send that to in a JSON format. So it basically sends that information as it happens to you, so then your application, your bot, or what have you can, can act on it. And so it's, it, webhooks are really cool, too, because they, they're a really simple way to get two applications or systems communicating with each other without having to get into more complicated, complex uh, protocols or, or specific APIs matching across different systems. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on webhooks, but if you want to get into those in more detail, there's a great learning labs uh, online. There's, you can learn about them here in sessions at Cisco Live uh, and so forth. All right, so I talked about some of the stuff that's new, some of the things I, I haven't yet. And so one of the really cool things that just came out, uh, I think it was around the end of the calendar year last year, was our presence API. So now, now this isn't the same if you're familiar with, like, Jabber presence and that sort. It's a little different from that. This is really just providing information about whether somebody's active or inactive, or how long ago they were active. Um, as well, we're 
you're going to start seeing do not disturb information coming through this, um, even out of office from, for example, um, Exchange being flowing into this, in, this present state. So um, there's an API to be able to get that. We've essentially enhanced the people uh, API to be able to provide that information as a parameter that you get back in those API calls to, to the people resource that lets you know if somebody's active or when they were last active and so forth. So that's a great enhancement. So if you want, if you have any applications where you're trying to integrate presence kind of in the, the traditional presence model, but you need to do that with the Spark approach, this is the way you do it. And it's very simple to do. Teams API, we talked about that. Bots, so this is, um, you know, you could do some bot integration initially when we launched Spark last year, but this is a real good enhancement around um, kind of the identities for bots. So, so now bots have their own specific identity in Spark where they actually show up kind of like a person, except they're, they're designated like in the Spark UI as, with a little bot tag over their avatar. So you know when you're communicating with a bot. But the key thing here is this provides a long-lived token that your, your bot application or integration can use to communicate with Spark just like it were its own user, but you don't have to do any you know, periodic login for it, right? It just has this access token that it can always use, and it, it's basically always identified as your bot and however you want that to appear within Spark. So I'll actually show you an example of that. And that's been out since about last summer. Um, enhanced webhooks, so I just talked previously about the messages API or the messages approach to webhooks, being able to get information about new messages in rooms. There's also the ability to get when there are room update, like somebody's created a room or somebody's updated a room um, or uh, memberships associated with a room, even doing some filters around, you know, not, not give me everything around messages, but certain types of messages. These sorts of things are now possible through the webhooks. The admin APIs we talked about off the top uh, on the last slide. Now, this, the client SDKs, we, we first not, um, announced these last summer at Cisco Live in Las Vegas in the United States. And these are basically the mechanism that we're first providing to be able to put Spark video experiences into other applications. So you can put, so if you want to have, um, say you have a CRM sort of application or your own web portal inside your company and you want to put the ability to have a video call right into that web app that we have a web SDK and some widgets as well. So you can you don't have to do a lot of visual design either. You can actually just easily put these right into your web page, just point essentially our SDK to a, a region within your web app. And um, very simple to do. And it uses basically WebRTC and our essentially the same sort of technology that's built into the Spark web client to do that. And then we also have an iOS version. So if you want to put Spark video into your, your mobile applications with iOS, uh, you can do that. So this is still in beta. We're hoping to release it uh, before too long within the next few months. Um, so if you, that there's, I think, I'm not sure if they're still taking people for the beta, but um, if you're interested, you can inquire about that. I think it's even online that you can sign up. OK, so um, now let me switch gears and actually start applying some of these APIs, right? So. So I'm going to be talking here about a loan processing application. So how many folks here have gone through the process of applying for and buying a house? OK, good amount of people. Um, or a condo or anything like that, right? So um, it's a very common experience for people. But from a business perspective, it's actually a very complicated process. And even for a lot of people to go through it, they, they find it's a very complicated process. Um, so it involves a lot of people that have to go through this. So why is it important, though, for, for um, businesses to maybe do this more in an automated way, the lenders themselves? The, the key here is the faster they can process loans, the, basically the more loans they can process, and the more loans they can process, the more money they make, right? So always kind of tying it back to the money, right? The, so the, the way they do these, though, is you have to have a team of people that are typically working on a loan from very, various different angles and aspects that have their particular expertise within the lender or even with partners outside. And they're interacting with a loan system of some sort, right? Now, we can speed that up with Spark and tying it together with a bot or an integration of some sort that is basically working with the loan system and Spark to help facilitate and make easier the collaboration that's needed for these 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 um, 
folks in the, in the lender company that need to work on processing this loan. So this concept, though, could be applied to a lot of different use cases in businesses of very different kinds, right? You have a team of people, maybe they're doing a very common um, task over and over again. You can apply Spark and automation through bots and similar integrations to help facilitate that and make it go faster and easier for the people doing it. So in this case, what we're going to really do is, is um, apply Spark in the following way. So a new loan comes in. It's kind of pre-approved. But then there's a bunch of steps that have to happen thereafter. So what we can automate here is actually automatically create the team. In, you know, so the loan application, the loan system could have the smarts to be able to know, OK, I need to create this. There's this new loan. It's reached this new state. I need to get, pull the following people together and put them in a team and automatically do that within Spark. So we could do that by, say, um, assigning a loan number and the last name of the applicants to that team so that the people working on it can easily see which loan they're working on. They can also, we can also then automatically create spaces or rooms under that team where people can um, you know, they kind of represent the different work streams that need to be done by the different folks involved to get the loan processed. Um, and then we can programmatically assign the team members to not just the team, but the particular rooms that they need to be associated with. So all that can happen and really kind of streamline the team organizing itself as opposed to their having to figure that out themselves every time. And then, of course, being able to put content and messages, which can be bi-directional or unidirectional, whichever, however you'd want to do it. But um, you know, a key thing that you really could do with you know the evolution now with machine learning, artificial intelligence, is really start applying a lot of that to looking at documents uh, and figuring and and seeing what's going on in the loan system and actually applying that to the room. And, and telling people, OK, these things are happening, or allowing even the, the team members themselves to be able to communicate through a chat sort of interface, like a chat bot to the system, get information out of it. There's lots and lots of possibilities there. So first thing, um, before we get into actually using the APIs, some notes on the authentication. So we talked about the bot authentication. So th this is uh, you know, that new thing I, I mentioned on the previous slide. But this is really an, for integrations that are acting on their own that need like an identity within a space so people can see that they're interacting with it or that it's doing stuff on their behalf. Um, in the room, uh, you know, you'd actually see that, that uh, bot as a participant. And so it's a very simple process to go and register one of these on Cisco Spark through the developer portal that I showed you. And I'm going to show you how to do this. And basically what you get back is an access token that you just use to authenticate all of your API calls. There's another approach, too, that we support in terms of authentication. And that is what I'm calling here user-based authentication. But if you're familiar with OAuth, this is really a mechanism where apps can do things on behalf of a particular user. So you're actually logging into it as a user to trust, to grant trust for the integration on your behalf. And then it can make, essentially, API calls using your identity um, so that those things happen for you. Um, and so that's a much more complicated uh, authentication model and integration than I have to get in here, than I have time to get in here. But basically, the way it works is you get for your application or your integration back from Cisco Spark through the developer's portal or client ID and secret that you use for all of your API calls. And what, what, those allows you, what that allows you to do is, um, through that OAuth flow, get an access token for each particular user that grants trust to your integration. And then that allows it to uh, make API calls for, you know, as if the user were doing it. So there's learning labs and there's information. I think some workshops or sessions here about this as well. So if you're look interested, um, you, can, you can find more information about that. So let me go back to the developer report. So here I'm going to actually go and do a, create a bot for this uh, fict fictional scenario I created around this loan processing. So all you do is you go into the Spark for Developers portal. You go to My Apps. So you just add a new one. So here you see there's the two authentication types you can create. Uh, integration, that's the OAuth-based approach. But we're going to create a bot. Now when you create a bot, it's literally just three things you have to provide. So I'm going to just call this Loan Bot. So I give it a name. Um, it's, it needs to have an email address, which we provide through Cisco Spark. Not boat, bot. 
So um, you just give it a, a, a name for the email address, for the, the first part of the email address, and we provide that with the at sparkbot.io uh, domain. And it'll automatically tell you if, if what you want's available there. And then you just provide an icon. So let's see, I already have one of these available here. Let me just copy that over. So we put in the, essentially the image, the icon, the avatar that's going to be used for the bot, and just click Add Bot. Just like that, you have a bot identity created, uh, you know, associated with your account in Spark that you can then use to make all your API calls. And, and that's the, the key thing that comes back here is the access token. So this access token, you're going to want to copy that and put it in a safe place. And you know, obviously use it in your code in a safe and secure way so that it doesn't leak out to, to anybody. Um, and so that's basically the, the authentication token that gets used for your API calls. And, and the system then knows that it's your bot that's making those calls. All right, so the, um, let me just show you, too, if I go back into my apps, you'll see that this was added. So there, my loan bot was added. You can even change some things about it after the fact, too. So if you wanted to change the, the name of it, you wanted to change the uh, icon, you can do that. And if you do happen to lose your token or you, uh, it gets compromised for whatever reason, you can regenerate that and then update your code to use that token instead. OK, so we have our bot created. So now we're going to actually jump in and, sh and do, the, do each of those steps we talked about for this loan bot, right? So the first thing we're going to do is create a, a team for the new loan. So you know, going back to these are RESTful APIs, we're going to do a post to slash teams. And basically, all we have to do is, pr is set name. So I've sh I'm showing in these slides here, actually, what you would do or what it would look like if you w did these things through the Spark for Developers portal in that test mode. But we're going to actually go and do it through a different tool here um, called PAW. So this is just on the Mac. You could do this via Postman, if you're familiar with that, just via a web browser. Um, but there's lots of tools that can that just make it easy to play with RESTful APIs or, or test them out, that sort of thing. So that's what I'm going to do here. So the first thing I'm going to do, though, is set that token. So I just basically just have this set up as a, um, an env a kind of environment variable here within this application. But this would be, you know, essentially where you would, in your code, you would set your token into some sort of variable or object, right? Um, and then so now that we have the authentication set up, all we do is a series of these RESTful calls to do, to the, do these things, like create a team. So we're going to do a post here to this URL, https colon slash slash api.ciscospark.com slash v1. And then slash teams is the resource that we use to, when we're doing things with teams, OK? Now, the first thing we do with these RESTful API calls, we need to make sure we have headers set up. It's pretty simple. All you need is a content type for JSON and authorization. So the authorization is actually where that bearer token, the, the bot access token, is being used. So it's automatically in this application pulling that um, from that environment variable I just set. But in your, in your code, you would be pulling that from you know, whatever variable you have the, the token associated with. So then all we do is um, set the name of the team through the name um, parameter. So name, and here we're going to set it as Johnson, so Mr. and Mrs. Johnson's loan, and the loan number, OK? Down here, the cool thing, the re reason I'm showing you this in PAW, too, is because it shows you not only here at the bottom what the HTTP call looks like um, in code, but you can also see this in other languages. So if you want to see what that might look like in Java, see at the bottom left? Let me move this up, actually, so you can see it better. Um, you can see what doing a RESTful call would look like in Java, if you're not familiar. Um, JavaScript as well. You know, there's PHP, Python. So um, this tool makes it kind of nice to be able to see how to do these RESTful calls in different uh, programming languages. So look, then we basically have everything we need to do this, um, to make this call from PAW here. So I'm just going to run that. And now what it's going to do is basically do that post request out to our cloud. And it came back with a 200 OK. And it basically confirmed back to me in the response. So we're looking at a JSON kind of tabular view of the response. Uh, but it's showing the ID for the team, the name that was, was set, who created it, and, and the time it was created. We could also see that in a raw form, the raw HTTP format. So basically, that's all you had to do to create a team. Very simple. All right, so we have our team created. 
now we're going to create rooms for the loan team, right? Now, I'm just going to do one here, but you could e easily do an iterative approach to create you know, a handful of uh, or however many rooms you need. But you do the same sort of thing. You do a post to slash rooms. You set the title. We're going to set this title for this, this room as application and documentation. So you know, other rooms you might have would be for like title, handling the title. Um, uh, you know, insurance and checks on the on the loan, handling the um, the appraisal, the closing, the underwriting, all these sorts of things, right? So you could create, you know, just through very simple API calls, which I'm going to show you these different um, these different rooms. So I have that preset up here in Paw. I'm not going to go back through uh, the headers and all that because those remain the same for each API call. So here again, the AP at the top there, we're just replacing teams with rooms here to do the rooms, to create the rooms. And here, the, the body um, parameters we're using are just title. So that's where we're setting the, the text, application, and documentation to the title of the room. And here, it's actually using the team ID. So the team that we created previously provided back that team ID. The team ID then we use here with the room call to associate this room with that particular team. All right, so let's go ahead and run that. So again, this just makes a post request up to our cloud. And bam, we have a confirmation back that our room was created. We have a room ID that comes back, which we're going to use in subsequent steps. Uh, the title is confirmed, um, and some other parameters there. So great, we have our team. We have our first room. So the next step was to assign lenders, team members, to the team. So this time, we're going to do a post, but it's going to be to slash team slash memberships. And we're going to specify the team ID and a person to actually add to the team. So that's going to that's set up here as well. We have, um, if you see up here at the top, we've changed the resources here to team and slash memberships. Then we just set the team ID, which is pulled from that previous step where we got the team ID. And we're going to just set the email. This could be multiple emails. I'm just going to do one but to this mroofer at kolbsys.com. OK, so we're going to run that. We get confirmation back from the cloud. And the JSON is shown here. But I got the, the membership ID, the team ID, person ID. All of those are, are confirmed back to you. You can see that in the raw format as well. And so now, um, now we can actually go into Spark and see that, this, that something has changed. So let me do that. Let me switch over to Spark here. So you see here, um, Here's Matt, log, that Matt Roofer account logged into Spark. You know, this is the Matt client. It could be any of the clients. And you see here that we have this Johnson loan. This is a team. This is the team's view here. So we can go into that team. Uh, you can see the loan bot that we created is the moderator, right? Uh, it automatically creates a general room or space for every team. But then also you see there's the application and documentation space that was created. And it also shows that it's unjoined by Matt, OK? But Matt's a member of the team, because we haven't gone and done the next step, which is add Matt to that, to that room or that space. So let, let's go ahead and do that. So that's the next step here. We're going to assign Matt to that particular room. So we're going to post this time not to team memberships, but to slash memberships. And we specify the room ID and the person or people to add. So we have that set up here. Here's slash memberships. That's the resource we call. We specify the room ID here from that first step, or second step up above where we created the room. We got that room ID and just the person's email. So I'm going to run that. We get the confirmation back. We got the room membership ID. We have the room ID, the person ID, all that information confirmed back. And now you see that Matt, if we go back to the spaces shown within that room, that Matt's now a part of that uh, space. And if we go up here to the ch kind of the room or chat view, of um, in Spark, you see that there's Matt's Matt's part of both the general room and the application and documentation room. All right, so that's the next to final step. Now the final thing we're going to do is actually put information into the room. So this is going to be a post to slash messages, um, and we just specify the room ID that we want to use for that. So that came from previous step. And we can specify just text that can go into that room or markdown. So markdown would be formatted text in a particular way. And that's what we're going to do. And optionally, you could put a file in. I'm not going to do that here, but um, you could certainly do that very easily. So here, same idea. 
uh, slash messages is the API call we make. We specify the room ID. From the previous step, it pulls that variable. Um, and the markdown. So you, the parameter you specify there is markdown. And you specify then the text with the special characters around them to get like bold here. Um, you can even do mentions of people through the markdown so that they get notified when that message gets posted so that they will pay attention to it. Uh, so let's go ahead and run that. We get confirmation back on that message. And you'll see now here in the room, we have that LoanBot said, hey, there's action required. And it's, it did a mention of Matt. Hey, Matt, um, there's a, the income in the documents provided doesn't match the application. Contact. Uh, the customer to fix that and even provides a link to maybe go into the loan system and get more information about it, uh, about the situation there. So that's it. That's a demo of the APIs. Very, I think you'll find that's very quick and easy for people to do right, from a, from, as far as development goes. Obviously, if you're not a developer, that's not super easy. But um, it, it's, a, it, it's actually pretty easy to get started if, if you're just learning development, too, to start using these APIs. So that's, um, we're, at, we're just about out of time here. So just to wrap things up, you know, um, key thing to keep in mind is APIs are not sort of an after afterthought for, for Cisco Spark. They're a foundational core part of what we're doing, the SDKs as well. So con you're going to continue to see a lot of investment and progress in terms of more capabilities being bu built out for Cisco Spark around uh, Spark for developers and such, enabling a lot more use cases and scenarios for, for integration, um, uh, ecosystem development, those sorts of things. And we have a pretty broad vision, and uh, we think it's an innovative vision, too, for where collaboration development should go and, and can go. So um, I encourage you to, to go and explore more around this. There's some great workshops, uh, learning labs here in the DevNet zone. Even if you can't get to it here at this event, uh, you can do a lot of it online afterwards. And, and of course, sign up for a, an account for Cisco Spark if you don't have one. It's free. And start playing with the APIs and learning more about them on developer.ciscospark.com. Uh, I, I also set up this session, so if you want to use Cisco Spark to have follow-up sort of questions, this will be open for a couple of weeks. So there, there's actually a room that would be added. You can opt into that through the, the event, uh, Cisco event app. And we can continue the conversation. There's lots, lots of Spark-related sessions here in the DevNet zone, uh, workshops, actual sessions like this, um, even breakout sessions in the general uh, Cisco Live event, and lots of just high levels or other, not high level, some of these are very detailed, but um, sessions just about Spark and different uh, deployment models, technologies, uh, product capabilities, that sort of thing. So thank you very, very much for your time. I really appreciate your, your coming here, especially first thing in the morning. Um, fill out your session evaluations, please. We you know, value your feedback uh, always, positive or negative. Um, I hope you really enjoyed the session. And of course, you can, you can get your uh, Cisco Live t-shirt. Lots more to learn, too, if you want to go through the Cisco campus. We have a lot being shown down there around Spark, the Spark board. You'll want to check that out. I think there's even a Spark board up here at the, at the back of this room, or the front of this room, and I guess it is. Um, so that's all for me. Anybody have any questions before we wrap up? One question over here. Let me come over since I, you're not going to be able to hear you. I'm sorry, what? Mm -hmm. So the question was that security, to the tokens for authentication, can they be limited in time, or can you re revoke them, that sort of thing? Um, so it, it depends probably on the model. So what's happening in the OAuth model is it's actually periodically refreshing that token that it would be using. Um, and that just kind of happens through those, those OAuth flows and such. But the, the bot authentication model, that's going to, if you wanted to revoke it, what you would do is go in and regenerate. You remember where I showed you creating the, the bot? You would go and regenerate a new token and put that in your code. But yeah, it is a, the, the point of the bot authentication is to, to be able to let the bot just continue to work on its own and not have to. Uh, so it's, there, you know, there's a little bit of a trade-off there. But yeah, if you do need to revoke it, you just regenerate and then update your code. Any other questions? 
Okay, great. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. Have a great Cisco Live.